chat. I will work on that as we're recording is in progress. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I assume. Um, good. Okay. So I think we're we're in uh, <laughs> good shape. I can see the chat. I'll try to pay as much attention as I can. Um, well, thanks so much for that that intro. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here, and I you know I laughed with how many best papers will be inspired. Like this is very much a call to action type of um, type of presentation. A lot of questions, really important questions, with you know beginnings of answers, but not close to full answers. And I really love for you know the many researchers on this call to think of this as uh, hopefully a, 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 a uh, making your motivation sections easier, <laughs> your related se work sections easier for a ton of a uh, ton of papers, you know, on the, these incredibly important research questions, and papers that make my papers look embarrassingly bad. So I know you all will do, uh, you all can and will do amazing work. Okay, let's jump on in here. If I can figure out how to change the slides. Oh my god! <laughs> so a bit about me, as as uh, as uh, Bob mentioned. Um, I was a professor at Northwestern, professor for uh, and previously at the University of Minnesota um, for uh, a number of years, and then I uh, got a call to uh, come help Microsoft redefine the future of work in, in late 2019. And so we had some pretty big significant changes in how work gets done you know, over that time. So it's been a wild experience. <laughs> I still have an affiliation uh, at Northwestern, as Bob mentioned, but I spend most of my time uh, doing what it says here, which is increasing the, the pace, impact, and responsibility of research within Microsoft's productivity uh, products. So, you know, Copilot is a lot of what we do these days. Um, you know, responsibility is in that, uh, was, you know, in that previous slide and a lot of what I what I think about and what I do. And, and you know, as a responsible AI researcher, I think it's always important to have a theory of change at a given time. Um, if it, it changes over time, it needs to be amortized over an entire career, <laughs> you know, these types of things. But, you know, right now, um, this is my theory of change. Um, I want Microsoft to maximize all of its opportunities at the intersection of what effectively will make Microsoft a lot of money and what is good good for the world. Um, I don't think Microsoft's particularly good at doing stuff. Um, I'm not sure if you can, can you see my cursor? No, okay, so on the left, I, I will do it. I'll do it yeah. uh, on the left side of the screen here, stuff that's that's good for the world. Um, uh, without that isn't really good at, good uh, for Microsoft. And of course, Microsoft's good at, at doing stuff that's good for Microsoft. So we want to make sure we're maximizing every opportunity we have at the intersection and not getting too distracted with, with other stuff. And the topic I'm going to talk about today, I, I hard to imagine a more canonical and important uh, case of being at the intersection of what's good, at my, good for Microsoft and I think what's good for, for the world in many ways. So we'll be having, there'll be a high stakes conversation here. So um, the outline of what I'll be doing today is here. Uh, we'll quickly run through just how important Wikipedia has been to the development of modern AI. I don't think Wikipedia, I don't think AI is what it is today without Wikipedia, not even close. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that and we'll, we'll focus on a case study from my career, which hopefully should help personify things a bit. Then I'll talk about the present uh, conundrum um, that uh, the dominant LLM paradigm uh, presents and that it uh, uh, threatens, you know, Wikipedia in certain ways. It threatens large parts of the content ecosystem that it depends on, and because it depends on that content ecosystem, it threatens itself. So it's a, a very interesting set of dynamics there. And then I'll uh, talk about uh, solutions, uh, what we can do as a Wikipedia research community, what we can do as a Wikipedia community, what we can do as a content ecosystems community more broadly, and what we can do as a community of citizens, um, global and, and uh, within our individual countries. Uh, as well. So I'll note that while uh, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, so I usually only accept talks where I'm like, yeah, I kind of already have some slides <laughs> ready to pull together. I'd lied to myself and said I had some slides ready to pull together to you folks. I, I was too tempted to develop sort of some custom thinking, custom, uh, you know, uh, custom content uh, for you all, just because it's a community I care about so much um, and uh, an area I care about so much. So I spent too much time on this, and it is going to be a little rawer than you might expect uh, from a standard, <laughs> you know, keynote address. You know, in, in general, I did I did spend uh, a couple of minutes touching up the slides on the uh, commute in this morning, um, but hopefully it will be you know more uh, relevant to your interests and uh, you know up to date with current thinking and such too. Good, um, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I don't think you can overstate the importance of the Wikipedia data set. Um, which is a very inhuman way to put it, but it is how you know people think about it in the AI world to the development 
of modern AI. Once uh, Wikipedia got to be a large enough uh, resource, you know, starting around 2004, 2005, um, it really filled a gap that was needed in the stochastic turn in uh, machine learning, natural language processing, AI, you know, more generally. Um, that you need a ton of data uh, to have these types of systems work. Um, you need a type of high, a ton of high quality data. Um, most of the systems were particularly interested in natural language. So you needed a ton of high quality natural language content. And Wikipedia provided that at a scale that we hadn't seen before. You know, uh, putting together this presentation was a bit of a blast from the past for me. I took a screenshot or two and sent them to, hey, look at what slide I'm presenting. <laughs> we're talking about uh, you know, some, old, some old friends and stuff like that. One thing I used to say is, is like, there's, there was no other way for, for a computer to understand in a structured way what Britney Spears was uh, prior to Wikipedia. And all of a sudden, you know, it, it could do that. Um, which had just unleashed a ton of just an amazing flywheel capability improvement um, and, you know, increasing data set size and, you know, these types of things. Um, I would often describe it as the, the research data set at first resort. Um, some areas where it's particularly influential, semantic relatedness uh, metrics, you can kind of think of these as proto LLMs, you know, LLMs are next word predictors. Next word prediction is a very close cousin to semantic relatedness. And you look at some of the techniques that were used then, they're kind of like, one or two layer um, LLMs to a certain extent. Um, obviously knowledge graphs, um, tons of advances in information retrieval, information extraction, like everything in information extraction came from Wikipedia. And you know, if, if with the data that is publicly available, um, you'll see Wikipedia as a core data set in the huge LLMs that are being produced today, um, you know, from the beginning. And of course, it's not just that, you know, academic research and not just LLM specific commercial applications, um, I used to try to keep track of all the ways I had heard about Wikipedia being used in very successful AI products. And this is like a screenshot of a notes file they have that's like massive, like <laughs> pages and pages and pages and pages. It was nice to be able to open it up again. You sort of see, and it hasn't been, you know, it got to be too much. I haven't updated it in a, in a long time. But just an example, like Siri is extremely, you know, reliant on on uh, Wikipedia. The knowledge Graph, obviously, both from Alpha. Alpha Facebook would use it all over the place. You know, YouTube. You know, we'll talk about Google, um, Microsoft, certainly. Um, even in Excel, you'll see Wikipedia content being used a bunch. Um, so uh, uh, you know, just incredibly influential in the development of AI and, and the broader computing ecosystem as a whole. Um, so to provide some color for this, I actually thought I might go take a trip back to around 2008 or so. So you know, this is what Wikipedia looked like. Um, you can see the screen I had to find, it took a long time to grab it, find this deck that I could still open <laughs> with something that looked like <laughs> Wikipedia 2008. So that's Wikipedia roughly 2008. And, you know, this is roughly what I look like, um, you know, at the time. And uh, I enjoyed showing my three-year-old that picture. She was very confused. She actually just um, cut off some of her hair because, you know, data doesn't have any, so she didn't thought she needed any either. So we're dealing with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the, I was an a early grad student at the time, and, and what I was trying to do was, I uh, see, we're having a few rendering issues, but that's okay. The, the message gets across <laughs> pretty easily here. Um, the, uh, what I was trying to do was uh, take part in the semantic relatedness race. So it was one of the standard benchmark-based race, and I've had this hypothesis that if I take the English Wikipedia and augment it with the other language editions of Wikipedia that would provide more data for the semantic relatedness measure to perform better on these, like, at the time I thought objective and perfectly uh, awesome benchmarks that had no challenge, <laughs> no problems at all. And uh, as the emoji mentioned <laughs> or, or indicate, uh, um, you know, I was failing pretty badly, but they was, it was failing in an interesting way. And looking into it more, uh, started just a massive uh, uh, line of research that you know I still uh, you know think about quite a bit, um, especially as we start to break through language barriers and get to cultural barriers. But that's a that's another story. Um, <laughs> um, I was investigating why it wasn't working, and the the you know we had to do some work at that time. You had to align the different articles across different languages to understand what they're covering, and if they're covering the same thing, if something is about the same topic, you know these types of things. Um, concepts is what we called it, you know, at the time. And, and what we ended up uh, seeing was that it, 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 the problem, the quote unquote problem 
uh, with uh, using the uh, language editions like I was uh, using them is that they describe the world very differently because language defined cultures understand the world very differently. And so this is a very well trodden area of research at the time, but we were all naive. <laughs> uh, we were all naive back then. And you know, we, we saw for instance that the vast majority of concept covered in multilingual Wikipedia um, are only covered in one language. Um, uh, shocking you know, to native English speakers like myself um, it puts us in our place. Uh, to learn that a huge percentage of German Wikipedia articles don't have English equivalents, <laughs> you know, these types of things. And then even if they do, even if two articles do, uh, or sorry, two language editions do cover the same concept, they cover them very differently. And then this map is really critical. It's not that just that they cover them differently. They cover them differently in a way that is you know, resonant to their cultural understanding of the world. So this is a sort of a network visualization of geographic articles and how important they are. Without getting into the details, you can see this is a Japanese Wikipedia. Japan is a huge size, size by the what what metric is in degree sum. Japan is very important <laughs> to the Japanese Wikipedia, you know, much much larger, much to a much greater extent than it is, um, you know, in other language editions. And you know that makes sense. And where this uh, and you know so great. Okay, so their the languages are different. This part of it was just so so critical though. As we said, okay, if they're different. And we have single we have a single set of benchmarks <laughs> that are defined in English. That's a that's a problem, or that seems to be confusing. What should we do about it? So we we implemented all of these different semantic relatedness uh, uh, algorithms, and we we gave them the world knowledge from each of these language editions of Wikipedia, and found that their output was like wildly different. Same algorithm, different world knowledge, different output. Very basic stuff right now. At the time when we thought algorithms, you know, the dominant perception, and I slides if folks are interested. In terms of when you started to see these types of things bubble up in the media, you would have you know large tech companies, you know, probably including the one I work for now. But I don't think I have any examples of that saying, "Oh no, this is just an algorithm; it doesn't it doesn't have an opinion about anything. It's like it's not it's not it doesn't have a cultural footprint." And so what this this showed is that yeah, yeah they, they you know the culture in culture out was the framing that we used, right? And so you know this led to many things, but one is me becoming friends with uh, some other folks who are looking at similar dynamics uh, across race and gender lines in coming together and, and starting to uh, starting the conference known as FACT. And all of this is because of Wikipedia, at least for me. <laughs> so, you know, it's like without the Wikipedia data set, without, uh, we, we wouldn't, you know, you know, who knows, maybe it would have taken longer, you know, these types of things. <laughs> uh, but, but at least with, res with respect to the degree that, you know, the work that we did helped out in that space, it doesn't happen without Wikipedia and all the work that people have done to describe uh, you know, encyclopedic world knowledge as they understand it in different languages. Um, so I see we're having some more serious uh, <laughs> rendering issues here with emoji, but that's okay. Um, I will ex I will explain. So um, you know, once we had sort of done that work, to, you know, uh, to the extent we felt that you know, you know, the, a lot of other people entering the space doing fantastic stuff. Like, okay, what's next? And you see this DEGB, <laughs> that should be the German flag and the Great Britain flag <laughs> uh, emoji. And uh, um, we had realized that, you know, we were spending a lot of time thinking about the culture and culture out dynamics from the human generated data sets. I do wish I had a pointer, but I think that's that's hopeless. From the human generated data sets we, at the- Brent, we, um, do see, we do see your pointer. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, good. <laughs> I feel like I, I feel whole now. Um, the uh, human generated data sets to the intelligent technologies. So culture in the human generated data sets, intelligent technologies absorb that culture. So we had this diagram. We realized that we kind of maybe were talking about maybe not the most important part of it, certainly an important part of it, but not the most important part because we thinking, you know, this was around the time as the, the tech clash was becoming a thing. Um, we're thinking, well, you know, like this is the ecosystem for all intelligent technologies. You know, the biases in, in the, content maybe aren't the most important biases. Maybe the biases and who gets the economic benefits and who has decision-making power, most importantly, um, uh, over how those technologies are used. Maybe that's a more interesting you know, set of biases uh, to look at. So, um, and, and I should mention here too, right? We started thinking, you know, Wikipedia is an interesting uh, and a sort of a sui generis case study, which is a little bit of an oxymoron, but <laughs> a very important data set to look at. But what about all content, not just Wikipedia? First starting, we sort of expanded into other open data and then you know, thinking about content ecosystems more generally. And so that began uh, 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 
now a decade long series of work that, that uh, started actually in what Bob mentioned. <laughs> so I actually was very inspired by, uh, you know, I think it was one of those things where we were thinking along the same lines and Dario at the first with workshop presented a, a talk um, where he he mentioned that he was sort of deeply concerned about something that he called the paradox of reuse. And we'll talk about that more, um, but it was effectively, you know, Google and other search engines um, using Wikipedia content without providing the traffic back um, in different ways, sometimes without attribution concerningly, most concerningly, but, uh, but more generally, um, uh, uh, violating or, or changing the bargain that had made Google and Wikipedia so successful working together. So we did some work just to say, hey, you know, it's important to highlight that Google is also reliant on Wikipedia. And, and Isaac Johnson, who now works for the foundation, who's on this call, is uh, the person we can thank for getting this work done and done well. <laughs> a much younger Isaac Johnson. Sorry, Isaac. It's, I guess it was seven years ago now. But <laughs> um, just did some amazing work where we did something simple. We we wrote a Chrome extension that that uh, uh, eliminated Wikipedia links. Now we couldn't take Wikipedia all entirely out of Google. It's deeply embedded in Knowledge Graph and um, all the the many machine learning technologies that any search engine would use. But so let's just take out the links. And we saw, um, and we had a, it was a my own first and only deception study. So we had people install this Chrome extension saying it was, you know, search research or something like this. And we saw that the people uh, who didn't have access to Wikipedia links just clicked on many fewer links. The click through drop was just massive. And I say click through drop of 1%, it's a big deal. I know internally here at Microsoft, that's a huge deal. <laughs> so, you know, if we're, drop, we're talking like a, a percentage wise drop here, we're talking, you know, pretty significant. I was actually looking at my, like, I say, I should say pretty, very significant, like, business threatening significant, <laughs> this drop if it were to extend it across all, all, all uh, search results. Actually was was uh, looking through some of that that old notebook that I mentioned and saw there, I grabbed some quote from uh, folks from Google when they had introduced BERT and they called it some deep search component into the search algorithm. And they had to brag about how and how much it improved the search results. They didn't put it in these terms, but they said basically it was half of what uh, Wikipedia contributes to our search results. So we have this big innovation in deep learning and it's half of what Wikipedia you know, contributed. It's sort of an interesting, you know, I have no details on that other than that press quote, <laughs> but sort of a, you know, an interesting frame. I like those comparisons too. I think it's helpful. You know, uh, following that, I'm not sure Nick might be on the call too. <laughs> if so, hi Nick. Um, the, uh, you know, if we followed that up with some research, like how often do Wikipedia links show up? And there's an argument that's the single most important source of content. For, for Google. So it's not like 100% of the time by any means. There's a plurality of sources of content, but it shows up you know, quite a bit across a you know, large number of queries. Um, so, you know, that got us thinking even further in, in you know, uh, about how we might change some of the power dynamics. And that got us thinking about something that we call a data strike, which is something that I never would have imagined being as prominent as quickly um, as it has become. Uh, but so this is a paper that that Nick Vincent, a former PhD student, um, now I should advertise for. <laughs> These are uh, I'm I'm very indebted to my students who are all doing amazing things or surpass me um, in in dramatic ways. Um, but uh, Nick's now a professor at Simon Fraser in Canada. So what we were doing in this study was we went outside the Wikipedia domain. We said let's look at recommender systems, focusing on a very well known data set called Movie Lens. And, sit, and when simulating data strikes, so people held that withheld their ratings, like how would that affect um, the algorithmic performance? And the comparison that that always stuck with me in that paper um, is that if 40% of users in a sort of very standard version of this data set went on strike, you would lose pretty much all the benefits of 20 years of recommender systems research. So you basically reset the field and its performance back to the beginning with 40% of users. Right? Okay, that's a, a pretty interesting data point. Um, and that led us to, you know, continue to explore different mechanisms. Um, and I will defer folks to these. Uh, I cover some of this in the, at the top, but for folks to these papers in particular on data leverage and data labor. So data leverage is a, is a concept that that Nick um, explicated in his thesis. And the data labor is done by another amazing former PhD student, um, Han Lin Lee, um, where we sort of write up here. It's like, here's the different ways that you can create leverage. Here's the different ways that you can understand data as labor and how that can help um, uh, empower uh, content creators in the in the content ecosystem, and you know we we tried we started doing a, you know a, a, as we started seeing 
um, more and more of the more problematic aspects uh, of the ecosystem shine through, uh, we started doing more and more public outreach, writing blog posts, you know, talking with the media, you know, these types of things. And these are the two blog posts I think are most uh, proud of the team. First one's written by Nick, the second one's written by um, the whole crew. Uh, but this was a GPT-3, don't give OpenAI um, all the credit for GPT-3. So we're, <laughs> um, you know, uh, before chat GPT, we're trying to get folks to pay attention to these types of dynamics. Um, you might have helped create the latest astonishing advance in AI too, and it actually talks about how central Wikipedia is to um, GPT-3, which is the last uh, uh, GPT that, that the data is, is public about. And then this second one I really like a lot, uh, GitHub Copilot and the Exploitation of Data Labor, a wake-up call for the tech industry. Um, GitHub Copilot was the first time when sort of these, these power dynamics and um, economic benefit dynamics in very, that, that, that uh, machine learning AI field are self-secluded, certainly myself included, um, were, were propagating, came, came to our doorstep, right? So it's like, this is, this is the, the situation that we've been enabling for others and might enable in, in the future. So um, I can't, you know, like I, I, without, like I said, without Wikipedia, none of that happens. <laughs> and I can't say how grateful I am that we were able to do all of that work because it set us up well for understanding, I think, arguably the most important issue facing the AI field um, and the AI business um, moving forward, which is uh, the relationship between AI technologies in their content ecosystems and how they threaten important parts of the content ecosystem like Wikipedia, like other open data sets, um, and in doing so, ultimately threaten themselves uh, or at least curtail their, their potential significantly. So we'll spend some time talking about that. So triangle diagram, you know, that first triangle diagram showed you, that was the early version. This is the version I use around Microsoft or an adapted version. <laughs> um, and it, it uh, uh, you know, it, it has, you know, better icons and, you know, updated words and, <laughs> and logos and stuff like things. But it's, it's basically the same, except for it looks through, uh, it looks at that triangle diagram through the lens of two grand bargains. And the first grand bargain is between cloud infrastructure providers and model builders. And this is very central to the news these days with NVIDIA, you know, these types of things. This is a very traditional grand bargain based on the exchange of services um, and goods for money, right? So it's very simple. Um, you know, it's a, it's a largely B2B grand bargain, works well, you know, uh, nothing fancy about it. The content producer model builder uh, uh, grand bargain, which had sustained the AI field up until ChatGPT came out, was a much less conventional one. Um, and it was one that I would argue, um, and our, our, our work argues, is based around information asymmetry and um, non-compete. So when I say information asymmetry, uh, in the Wikipedia context, tons of Wikipedians just did not understand the value they were creating and the, the capabilities they were creating for other actors who would use those capabilities in ways they may or may not agree with. And that's, that was true for everybody, right? So when we were training search engines with our clicks, we were rating products, you know, these types of things, we didn't really have a, the general public did not have a full understanding of the value it was creating. You could sit like, like the in existence proof or that's the wrong frame, but you know, one data point that is quite obvious is the general public was, it, you know, at by the time, you know, I was using this triangle in keynotes and stuff like this in 2017, 2018, um, you know, the tech lash was fully, fully uh, unleashed. And, you know, people had no understanding they had this as a source of leverage, right, that, that, that they were an important part of the, the supply chain in this way and could, could push back in this way. Um, so, you know, uh, that, that was one element of the grand bargain. And the other was non-compete. And this would show up a bunch in, in the keynotes that I would give when I would talk about these types of issues. It, you know, when you give a talk a number of times, you start to get a common set of questions. And one of the common sets of questions was, I don't really care that Google's using my search results, you know, it helps me with my job, seems like a reasonable trade-off, like, that's fine. Like, I don't, you know, like, I'll help Google with my labor and Google will help me with my labor. But that was based on a non-compete. They didn't have a perception that Google or any other tech company was going to use that labor to supplant their primary source of income. And that all changed uh, with, with ChatGPT and the first family of products based on, on ChatGPT. So the information, information asymmetry has melted away it has been astonishing the degree to which uh, my talks change. But I used to have to spend 20 minutes talking about 
data level, you know, like how, how we contributed to machine learning systems, you know, these types of things. I can just mention it in 15 seconds now, including, you know, to leadership at Microsoft and, you know, these types of things. They get bored very quickly. <laughs> so it's a, you know, the, the aware, awareness raising mission is, is over. Um, and then non-compete is also heavily eroded by the, the nature of these, the current nature of the current paradigm. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, uh, the first set of businesses that have been built around that. That the paradigm. So people do feel threatened, and we see that all the time in, in my, uh, you know, work at Microsoft. That's not all related to this stuff. We, you know, people don't have a level of trust. We'll talk about that in a sec. That's much lower than it used to be um, in AI systems. So we need a new grand bargain uh, with content producers, uh, and that's you know one way of understanding the great deal of uncertainty and tension that we feel you know in the field um, at the moment. Um, and what are some of the downstream effects of that uncertainty and tension, we'll, we'll talk about them. Uh, we'll talk about two families of them. I'd say capabilities, and this is one that I think uh, is essential and not discussed enough, and societal impacts, which is discussed more often. So I'll highlight a few that I think are not discussed enough. So on the, the, the capability side of things, what has happened is the misalignment of incentives, the lack of a grand bargain, has left, led to an era of data strikes. Again, like some of the data strikes ideas that you know Nick and Hanlon and I had eating lunch around the lab table in 2018 are now like deployed at scale. And it's like, uh, uh, it, it's it's uh, astonishing to see, um, you know, there's a huge, you know, a huge percentage of news organizations, for instance, have blocked uh, uh, LM crawlers um, in robots.txt. Um, there are, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about a number of different ways uh, things are about it. I, I just say Elon Musk cutting off OpenAI's access to Twitter. Um, for all of the challenges I have with many of Elon Musk's uh, uh, beliefs to the point that I no longer participate, <laughs> uh, participating in the strike against uh, uh, against his platforms. Um, you know, he, when when you cut off OpenAI from Twitter, you are, that's a data strike and, and eventually a very powerful one. And there's emerging, you know, evidence that unsurprisingly well-executed data strikes likely are highly effective against language models, particularly across domain boundaries. So if, for instance, um, all the news organizations were, or a significant proportion of news agencies were to strike, um, you would see a decrease or, a, you know, a, a substantial lack of increase um, in the ability to output, you know, news and news-related content, legal you know, these types of things. Like it, it seems to particularly matter across domains. Um, and so what are some of these data strikes look like? I mentioned robot.txt, IP blocking. Um, you're seeing an increasing number of organizations put everything behind a paywall or a registration wall. And, you know, increasingly I would expect there would be more work, uh, work stoppages and some class action lawsuits, you know, these types of things. But I want to point out one of the highest effort data strike, <laughs> but also a very effective one is going out of business. And, you know, a lot of these systems uh, have created the perception in many actors in the content ecosystem that they will put them out of business. So perplex the perplexities in the news right now, how it takes content and it, uh, uh, it's very, uh, it gotten some trouble for not following the robots.tech stuff. We'll believe that aside. It takes content and summarizes it and does not provide traffic back to the original content and does not provide revenue back to the original content, which, you know, will, uh, that's the, those are the two sources of being for content producers. And so what this suggests is like data strikes might be guaranteed in the current paradigm. So either you have a successful one and resources flow to content producers in a way that's sustaining critically, or you don't have one and the content goes away. <laughs> so you kind of have a, 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 a near guarantee. And I should say this side of, you know, fo focusing now on the, you know, this side of the diagram on, on uh, professional content. Um, the same is true for non-professional content, you know, in its own way. Um, and that's where, you know, this uh, discussion that Bob started and, you know, might continue around this notion of paradox of reuse or what is you're now heard. I think this is probably a more um, media friendly name, a doom loop <laughs> uh, is, uh, you know, uh, in place. You know, Stack Overflow is a great example. Um, Stack Overflow, you know, GitHub Copilot is really dependent on Stack Overflow to answer questions. GitHub Copilot as a product existentially threatens the reason people go to Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow declines, GitHub Copilot suffers. I think this is this is the doom loop, and you know the the, the 
loop continues. Um, there's also a, you know, another dynamic here, I think, which is really important, and I think something we're all feeling, is the use of content from user-generated content communities, regardless of whether they're open, they're open or not, in this way, threatens the social contract between the platform and the contributors in, in critical ways. So you saw this, for instance, with Reddit, um, you see this with Stack Overflow and some of its latest deals. So that is also, um, you know, as the Wikipedia Foundation knows well, the Wikimedia Foundation knows well, like the platform is a, you know, a, a shell on top of a community. If the community isn't successful, the platform will be successful. And uh, if you violate that social contract between those two, that's that's trouble. Um, and uh, we've seen some evidence that the doom loop has begun. So there's a very convincing, at least for me, very convincing Stack Overflow study that creatively looked at the English Stack Overflow versus the Russian and Chinese ones, where ChatGPT is harder to get access to, um, Microsoft's products are harder to get access to, um, and found a significant you know, decrease in engagement effectively you know, above or below what we'd expect. And there was a recent paper looking at Wikipedia didn't find as much of the same effect, um, but uh, I would hypothesize that if, for instance, the Google AI search overviews uh, go uh, scale up significantly, then we might find uh, some uh, growing effect there. We talked about the Reddit moderators by uh, strike. Yes, and so uh, I was really, um, you know, my company takes part in this too, but I'm disappointed in the field right now that we're not taking a step back to realize to, and think through some of these ecosystem challenges. So Google just made a big push to, to uh, do some of these AI summaries from similar to perplexity. Um, in uh, search results, many folks probably saw the news coverage. You probably have seen them in your search results. Um, it's definitely something that Bing Copilot has done as well. And I don't think we're thinking through the, um, the implications of that well. One way to understand this is the problems that Dario mentioned, the paradox of reuse in 2015 with Wikipedia are now the world's problems. I said they're all content producers' problems because of these AI search overviews. And we need to figure out a solution for everyone's sake. Yeah, so the paradox of reuse of everything. So <laughs> no way I might talk about this. I'm uh, using fresh slides uh, and don't have that preview slide next to me, so we all get surprised together. Okay, <laughs> so uh, uh, our data strikes guaranteed. Um, you know, we have uh, the case on the professional content side, and we've sort of talked through what it would look like on the, the uh, non-professional or user-generated content slide. Um, these slides I have used before, um, as you might be able to tell from their framing. Okay, so that's capabilities. Um, we're made building LLM systems that are just much less capable than they could be if the incentives were aligned and content producers and LLM system, LLM, uh, base systems uh, benefited together with content production. Um, let's talk about societal impacts, in particular, some that that um, I think are particularly relevant to this community and um, aren't discussed as much. So, uh, or discussed, uh, it should be discussed differently. You know, obviously, one that is discussed is, is uh, labor disruptions. Um, you know, this is something I have a separate talk, happy to give at, at, at anywhere anyone wants <laughs> on five misconceptions about the future of uh, work and AI. Um, the labor dis um, uh, disruptions story is more complex. Um, we can learn a lot from the history of uh, uh, technology and productivity, but um, I do think there's an important elephant in the room related to the non-compete, which is that you see a lot of studies, here's what AI can do, don't worry or worry. <laughs> the, the key thing is, is there are institutions, you know, OpenAI is one of them that are very explicit that they want to supplant all work with AI. So if you look at the first paragraph of OpenAI's um, nonprofit charter, so I'm not saying anything in, internal or secret by any means here, they define, a, they say they really want to create AGI that benefits humanity and they define AGI by basically something that can do all work. Um, so you can see the highlighted text here, by which I mean highly autonomous systems that output for humans and most economically valuable work. Uh, and so where the, you know, the non-compete discussion needs to go is, yeah, you might not be there yet, but that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> and we need to have a conversation about whether that's something that we should be trying to do. Um, you know, I, I think uh, just because of time, I'll sort of skip through some of this. Uh, the one real, at, at least the detail of it, one risk of labor disruption is actually just a significant drop in the labor share of revenue across the economy. 
Um, and that has, that basically is like what percentage of the profits labor makes versus capital makes. And that has like a huge series of really terrifying implications, at least uh, it's associated with really terrible outcomes. Um, economic productivity is one. Uh, so, uh, you know, economic productivity goes down with too much economic concentration, uh, failure of democratic institutions, um, and it you know, uh, challenges certain ethical frameworks. If you create value and don't get credit for it, it challenges a lot of the ethical frameworks that people implicitly live their lives by. Um, so that's something, you know, we should all be thinking about. Um, one thing I is less discussed that, you know, very related, I want to spend just a bit more time on is the risk of a legitimacy crisis in AI. So I like the way I phrased this in the first bullet, like what happens if the dominant technology that powers everything has such a wide mismatch between value accretion and value creation? Like, can a market still work? Can people still believe in any notion of, you know, broad meritocracy or, or you know, meritocracy has all of its problems? <laughs> But there's a, a, a directional signal there, and if it gets muted enough, will people still believe in it? And you start to see this type of, I mean, work framing that we would use sort of casually as not like a, as a joke, but just as like you know when you're having a research discussion to ex explore the extremes. We, we this this framing of original sin is something that <laughs> at, at, you know came up in that early triangle days. And then, you know, the other uh, two months ago, I wake up in the New York Times Daily is <laughs> saying AI's use of content uh, is, and how it doesn't provide value back to the content creators is the original sin of AI. And, you know, uh, uh, it, that just follows you like three centuries, four centuries later that could, that could follow. And there's an example of that, which is the, the folks should read about the English enclosures, which is the taking of commons, commons and, making it privatized um, in what's now known as the United Kingdom, you know, many hundreds of years ago. Uh, and it led to societal disruption for hundreds of years and, you know, likely the beheading of at least one king, although indirectly. <laughs> uh, and you see a lot of these, there are these folks who are called diggers and levelers are very similar to people who are doing data strikes and data poisoning attacks and stuff like this uh, right now. So that, that's a you know, point of reference that I, I find um, helpful. Um, and then there's just more, things that de that uh, um, continually concern me with regards to legitimacy. So um, Nick led a, a paper that was just published at CHI this year that continu that continues to trouble me significantly. So it, it, it uh, and I think troubles everyone who hears about it. So um, if you look at some of the core, the most common data sets used for training, not including the open ones, um, uh, what Nick, what this paper showed was that the authors and the owners of that content um, tend to be disproportionately at large rates uh, relative to other Americans, American Jews. And one reason that's the case is, uh, and this is true for a number of other demographics for which the paper states probably, this is probably true as well, is cultural groups, uh, ethnic groups that had challenges Keep, keep uh, with legal systems allowing them to keep physical property or own physical property, most notably in the United States, uh, a lot of folks from Europe, um, the Jews from Europe who had property and then didn't one day, and uh, Asian Americans, particularly Japanese Americans who had property and then didn't one day, uh, you know, sought intellectual property as a, a respite um, from that type of property dispossession. And I was actually raised, those of you, if there are any other American Jews on the call, you might recognize this phrase. I was raised with the phrase, they can't take your education away from you <laughs> as, a, as a way to uh, encourage my studious, um, uh, a stu a encourage a studious culture <laughs> within my family. And um, that's very much what these technologies in some ways do. And that's, deep, that's just something that troubles me. And I think points to, you know, when you have these types of dynamics going on, I just think there'll be a, a large number of cases where it's like, oh, if you look at it through this light, it's even more troubling. <laughs> um, you know, it's, if, if it's in a, a process that is potentially considered illegitimate, there's going to be all sorts of downstream ways that, that we're going to start viewing that process that, that add to the pressure um, against its legitimacy. And, you know, this is definitely one of them. Um, so, you know, uh, that's a result I'm still wrestling with. Um, and then, you know, I was looking at the research papers that are uh, being presented and being jealous that I can't see some of them. <laughs> but I did notice that, you know, that, that um, you know, filling content gaps is, is something that, something I care deeply about, something that we all 
still care a bit deeply about and something that there's still a lot of research, including here, on. And in the LLM light, it gets problematic because, you know, when I hear someone, oh, we need to make sure that there's uh, as many, you know, resources for LLM training in um, under-resourced language X, I think to myself, well, the current dynamics are such that that content is going to be used in a way that the value accretion goes very disproportionately to outside of the speakers of that language. Um, and unless we can get that right, uh, the accusations of data colonialism here, I think are you know, something to wrestle with. I struggle with them. So I think we need to, like the content gaps uh, conversation is just much more complex now because of the lack of the bargain that was in place beforehand. And what really makes me sad <laughs> and what it really gets me excited too when I'm in my more optimistic mood in terms of what we can do is that it doesn't have to be this way. You know, uh, Sam Altman in a New York Times interview by Ezra Klein conversation talked about seeking public money for initially seeking public money and not getting it. And, you know, that, that got me thinking of this relationship. Um, you know, I am... Uh, of an age where I did not exist when the uh, Americans set foot on the moon. Um, <laughs> my parents were like 18 or 19, so maybe they paid some tax dollars in the small amount <laughs> to contribute to that. And, you know, many people in many languages use the first person plural outside of the United States as well um, to refer to the moon landing. We went to the moon. And uh, that gives you a sense of like when we have a collective achievement, <laughs> you know, what that sounds like and what that looks like, as opposed to these models, which are, you know, I, we have to be clear, are extraordinarily impressive. They're also collective endeavors, but we use frames like they did this, OpenAI did this. And you see conversations like they took my stuff. This is an op-ed by Nick and Han Lin. And that narrative being uh, resonant because it, it it's accurate to a, a, a large set of facts um, that a large set of people have. So my question is, how do we go from this right to to something like this, which is something that I think all of us want. So then, um, I have about five more minutes here. Sorry, Bob. I did my best to predict <laughs> big time. We <laughs> about ten minutes for questions. What should the Wikipedia community do? You know, in this moment. Uh, to address these challenges facing itself, um, facing its uh, other content creators, um, other content creation communities, and the AI ecosystem more generally. And so my first proposition here is that um, we have to understand that if it's willing to use it, the Wikipedia community, not just the foundation, but the community, has a good deal of leverage. Um, and it has even more leverage if it acts in concert with other um, open data communities, which I think are sort of natural allies in this respect. And we've seen that leverage work in the past. So the, I know the enterprise feed is not something that's universally popular, but one thing that it is, is an uh, outcome of a discussion that, le that led to a sending of uh, uh, resources from the, an AI system to a content creation platform that can help support that content creation. And that was the out outcome of uh, a lot of discussion and uh, highlighting that both sides were in it together. <laughs> um, and that often includes highlighting that both sides have, have some degree of leverage uh, in the situation. And you know, within Microsoft, I talk about four different sources of content leverage. We've talked some about data leverage, so I'll go over that quickly, but we should also talk about legal leverage, policy leverage, and reputational leverage. And all of these are, well, roughly speaking, additive. Um, they probably have some positive interaction effects. So on the legal leverage side, of course, can't talk about any active lawsuits, but I can talk about legal research. <laughs> and I can tell you that uh, the legal research suggests that copyright law in this is just a tiny part of the picture. Um, you know, we're running short on time. I just want to highlight this story. If folks are familiar with the Henrietta Lacks um, story. So she had a cell, uh, some cells that were extremely influential in the creation of many modern medicines, modern medical techniques, you know, these types of things. And just recently, her family was finally getting compensation um, through some legal mechanisms, particularly around un unjust enrichment um, from the lack, from the, their, uh, their use of her cells without her consent. Um, and there's some interesting parallels there that might be 
that people are exploring. Um, and there's also this, like, again, we're all in it together. Like one of the core economic values of language models is that they produce content. So if you reduce the value of content, you reduce the value of the language model. I need some help um, understanding that on the economics front. If anyone is an economist here, <laughs> uh, please, you know, I was just seeing a related paper by John Kleinberg. I was just going to ping him and say, can you look at this related question too, <laughs> to help us understand this dynamic? Um, you, you see this with like, for instance, with, with synthetic data, if you can generate a whole ton of synthetic data to train another model from another model, what's the value of creating a big model? Um, policy levers. There's some very simple policy interventions that can change the L1 world overnight. Um, doesn't have to be able to pay decision legally in any number of jurisdictions. So to quote Nick and Hunland's op-ed, it's just don't overcomplicate things. Just clarify that fair use under copyright law in the United States does not allow for training a model on content without the content owner's consent. Um, that would change a whole lot. Um, I've been impressed with the sophistication of some of these, the, the sophistication and the 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 um, the, and the and the not overcomplication of uh, things from certain actors. Uh, a lot of folks highlighting that um, you know, this is something that's deeply important to a lot of our research. Data strikes are best done collectively. That raises some antitrust considerations. So the author skills, for instance, pushing for an antitrust exemption is a sort of is a um, uh, you know uh, that application of anti antitrust law goes against the purpose of antitrust law. Um, so, you know, people are figuring this kind of stuff out. I think this is pretty realistic. And then there's reputational leverage. Uh, if you look at polling data, um, the, the tech loss has gotten meaningfully worse uh, since the, the chat GPT came out. So trust levels, even within the United States, where they were much higher in the tech industry, have gone way down. And a lot of that is the result of, I think, people using reputational leverage quite well um, against companies like mine. Um, the way I think it's more healthy to frame that, um, you know, moving forward is this, we all want trust. <laughs> so, um, you know, can we find ways to build up the, uh, trust together, you know, in our, in our uh, institutions? I think lots of opportunities for win-wins there. Um, and then data strikes. So I don't, I think I'll you, be giving you the basic idea. I, I, I will say, uh, or sorry, data leverage CDC, the basic idea, we've done data strikes. I do want to talk briefly about C CDC, which is the inverse of data strikes. So this is, this is a, for instance, an open data community, making it easier for companies or institutions or organizations that adhere to their values uh, to um, uh, use the data, just making it easier, like leaning into that versus leaning into sort of any, you know, uh, uh, any allowing any organization to do anything, right? Um, and I also want to highlight that the current LM paradigm is far from the only one that can exist. Um, in particular, there is some exciting work that, that I see coming that uh, can sort of remix content um, on the fly. It's slow, which is the problem, main problem right now, but remix content on the fly such that you always know where that content is coming from and you can pay for that content or otherwise you can attribute and pay for that content, you know, in, in ways that, that allow for a functioning market to be stood up. And so I really encourage folks, and there's a large and growing literature on this type of thing, encourage folks to not think that the current technological paradigm is the only one that can provide the benefits that the current technological paradigm does. There are many other options that we can choose. And I think because of all the leverage that content owners have, the organizations and companies that lean into those alternatives are gonna have a leg up. Um, I, I'll add that as well that um, the use of leverage will take effort. So there's a no pain, no gain. I actually was looking at ter terms for um, must being muscular that sounded appropriate for a middle-aged man to use and there weren't many so <laughs> the logo didn't get these muscles overnight <laughs> uh, wikipedia recommended um muscular hyper hypertrophy so we, <laughs> that's what the logo did to get this um and you know it's going to take some pain i think to to use leverage as well as it needs to be used and you know one thing and i'll, I'll raise this it's good sort of entering into discussion here um, I think a lot of open data communities have embraced open as a value when it actually is a tactic uh, to achieve a different set of values. So with respect to the Wikipedia community, they want to allow any, you know, like 
I as a member of the community, at least, yeah, you know, obviously looking at this through my lens, right? We want to provide humans access to knowledge for free and a maximum amount of knowledge that we can. And that might not be directly aligned with using open licenses in the way that we had in the past. You know, there's a lot of literature on this, and I'm going to simplify it in a way that bastardizes it. But the, um, uh, the, you know, when you have open data, it's a commons. You can think of a common forest. And the people who benefit most from a common forest are the lumber mills that are closest to the forest. And right now, those lumber mills are companies like mine um, and many other along companies. I'm thinking like, is there are there ways for us to make the make things equidistant, make the lumber mills equidistant <laughs> from the forest, bring everyone close, maybe a good way to talk about it. And there's some explorations of this. So I was involved in, in getting um, an initiative called Responsible AI licenses off the ground, something to consider. One of the biggest things that we encountered there is enforcement is hugely important. So you would need a large institution like a Wikimedia Foundation or a Microsoft uh, to enforce uh, some of the provisions uh, for them to be real. Um, and licensing is not the only solution. Uh, it probably can't survive alone. It has to be done with complementary sources of leverage. And we talked a lot about those. And then there's the question of how Wikipedia should use its leverage. So um, yeah, I think this brings me back to the, the overlap I used to start the talk. And this is the last second to last slide, I believe, um, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, I think the easiest stuff is stuff that's great for Wikipedia, stuff that protects the Wikipedia community. Um, the harder stuff is stuff that shifts AI towards better outcomes as a whole. But there probably are a lot of actions that are highest value that li live at that intersection. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to the, in this category. It's incentivizing AI systems that use Wikipedia to reflect Wikipedia values. So what are some of those that, and these are, this is again, entree of the discussion. What are some of those values that might help? Free and accessible repository of human knowledge. So Wikipedia faces similar challenges to all other open content producers and many non-open ones. So if you solve some of those paradox of reuse, reuse issues, doom loop issues with um, Wikipedia, you might solve it for everyone. No original research. Wikipedia relies very heavily on things like news organizations and other content producers you know, around the world. Does Wikipedia want to take a stake in trying to help them succeed so that it can continue to cite, to cite high quality sources. Citation and verifiability. This one I'm really excited about. These systems, because of the nature of the paradigm, are terrible at this. Um, you know, is it, is it useful to make a stand in this area and push people into thinking about other types of LLM paradigms, some of which I mentioned earlier, um, that, you know, people will react if there's a, a, a incentive in the market to do so um, and shift more towards uh, LLMs that can attribute provenance, and that would unlock a lot of um, value, uh, uh, ways to pass value to content creators as well. And I would open up to you, like, where, are there other things that sit at the intersection of what's good for Wikipedia um, and, you know, what's good for the AI ecosystem as a whole? So with that, actually, that's it. Um, I'll take any questions now. I went five minutes longer than I even predicted at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that, Rob. We have a bit of time for discussion. And I actually haven't uploaded my slides here yet. I will um, uh, after the, the talk. Thanks a lot, Brent. Um, maybe a round of applause for everyone. Um, we'll make sure that we have uh, at least 10 minutes for discussion because I think a lot of um, it was very thought provoking. I'll kick it off with, um, with a few questions from the document. And then later on, um, I will also open it for more spontaneous questions from the room. So if you have any, you know, I will, um, I will solicit those uh, as well. But let's start uh, with one from Tillman. Um, actually, Tillman, if you're in the room and you want to ask it yourself, feel free. Otherwise, I, if I don't hear from you in the next five seconds, then I'll just go ahead and read it. OK, so uh, I'm going to read it. An uncomfortable question for us Wikipedians, how much of the central role of Wikipedia for AI and specifically today's large language models is due to its unique qualities and how much is simply due to the convenience in particularly frequently updated dumps in contrast to lockdown paywall content say purposes of academic publications? So I think that's a great question. And I, one thing I just want to highlight is like, it is a time to ask difficult questions. Like I, I don't, um, 
quite frankly, I don't sleep as well as I did, you know, three years ago <laughs> because all this stuff is is so relevant. I'm and I'm in a position, you know, within Microsoft to be uh, you know, I said my theory of change, you know, it's it's, it's like, can I uh you know get some bets going in in um in certain ways or make certain changes um that are good for Microsoft and good for the world. Um I think that's you know anyone who fancies himself a leader in the Wikimedia research community, the Wikimedia community, it's time to ask tough questions. So please don't go badly. We have to, that means you have to be all open to sounding a little less educated and um, uh, confident than, <laughs> than we used to be because kind of tough questions usually have tough answers. We need to work together to, uh, to figure them out. So I will give you a, you know, my best answer <laughs> to that, but, you know, please put the appropriate asterisks on it, um, you know, as I mentioned. Um, I think that it, I think the answer probably is both. Um, the, you know, convenience does matter. You're effectively asking how much data leverage does Wikipedia actually have. And again, I'd also say, remember, there's more than just data leverage. There's policy leverage, right? Reputational leverage, you know, legal leverage, and these types of things. Um, and you know, uh, so some degree of it is from convenience. And if it obviously data strike would remove convenience, um, but some percentage of it is is like like what I said before. There's no better like if a computer needs to know about Britney Spears, what else is it going to do, really? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's core level. But there might be some alternatives now in synthetic data. We had, I had to cut that part out of the slides on this topic, but that's only a partial solution. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, you know, I think my best answer. Others might have good answers there, too. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brent. Then we have another one from Pablo, who's asked, who's, uh, asking about unionization. He says, strikes are the result of collective organizing. Just as unions played a key role in improving labor conditions after the Industrial Revolution, do data unions need to be institutionalized to improve justice over the LLM revolution? So there's a lot of interesting work being done there, including stuff that was been, has been um, advanced by uh, Jaron Lanier and Glenn Wiles, who are my colleagues at Microsoft. Microsoft actually has a partnership that I'm really excited about with um, a large union here in the United States uh, to think through a lot of these issues. Um, and so I'm excited about the. Can you? I guess you can't, folks. Can you hear me? Now again, you can hear me. Okay. It said my default Microsoft, my default microphone changed. Um, so <laughs> uh, that's a little, it's a little surprising. Um, the um, uh, I, I think one has to think very strategically and carefully about those mechanisms, though. You can't just have an idea. You have to be a student of the labor movement, student of what works and what doesn't, um, a student of, uh, uh, I say, technology and uh, economics. Um, so, you know, one thing, for instance, that's really important to our partnership with the, the large union um, is that, you know, uh, one thing technology does very well is actually grow the economic pie. And if you're growing the pie fast, the share of the pie becomes less important because everyone's slice is growing. Um, and that's something to be thinking about too with the, those types of efforts. Um, thinking about actually what people participate in them want. Um, so yeah, just the, I would be, I, I think those are interesting and can be great partners for companies like Microsoft, but we have to figure out the tactics. Uh, since I'm the facilitator, maybe I'll I'll, uh, I'll abuse my privilege and ask a question uh, of my own. There was recently this case, prominent case of the Internet Archive, which featured on your slides also. Uh, they're about to lose uh, a lawsuit because they gave they gave out uh, basically scanned books in a way that uh, was basically they gave an unlimited number copies out. Although it was all digital, but they basically parallelized. Uh, the book and they were then sued by a big publishing company and it seems that unfortunately they're going to lose that case the argument that they're making is that it should be done that way because there is a moral obligation to get people access to all the knowledge that's locked away in those books if people's access to information is now via large language models wouldn't there also be a moral obligation to give the large language models as the transmission engines access to all that information that would otherwise be locked away? Um, I think that that is a, 
potential. So with the we, the open models versus closed models discussion is is definitely one that is relevant to what values the Wikimedia community might want to push for. I think it's a complex. I encourage everyone to think through again very tactically the complexity there and what actually that because that is a tactic making it open versus the goals, which is Rob what you mentioned is an imperative to provide legal access, you know, to information in perpetuity and high quality information. And we have to think long term about that. So, um, you know, I would ask, I don't have the answers here, but I would ask, is that action by the Internet Archive really in advancement of that goal? Because you need to have a sustaining content ecosystem in order to have books written over time. And what future books are not going to be written because of the threats to the publishing industry? And of course, there are all sorts of improvements one can make to the degree to which the publishing industry takes money in and supports content, high quality content creation. But, you know, it, it exists and it does it. Um, and we can work towards those improvements um, as well. But we have to think intelligently about that type of thing because the, again, the tactical, let's just get the information out there, uh, I think is, is backfiring in important ways as I've talked about throughout this, this, this talk. Um, and we have to take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so at this point, I would um, see if there are questions from the audience, spontaneous questions that were, you want to ask yourself. If so, just um, raise your hand or just speak up. Yeah, we have Moyan. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you for the great presentation. I just have one question because um, now we see, um, I guess, news about like Stack Overflow already replacing their workers with AI. Um, and also I think if companies feel like it's less or um, they could pay less using like generative AI, then I think it draws them to just replace human workers with, and then so there's a gap for humans in terms of what they used to do. And I'm wondering if you have any thought on as re researchers, how do we kind of, instead of the idea of replacing them, but creating more, maybe different kind of task for these people, because we got to work. Like, what about these unemployment, you know, created by AI? Like, do you have any specific thoughts on what kind of work that they should shift or what kind of task um, these people that lost their job because of AI, what, what, what else can they do? Well, so this gets it, this, this, I think there are several questions. Thanks for the several questions and all of them good ones, <laughs> you know, in there. Um, you know, one thing I'll say is, and this goes more towards my five misconceptions talk, which is that it's, it's generally speaking a bad idea to as a first, F, uh, on first principles to think about, lab, uh, to think about Productivity enhancing technologies as labor substitution technologies um, and lay people off as a result. If you are a business that doesn't believe you can grow at all, um, or if you're a person that doesn't believe you can grow at all, or a team that doesn't believe you can grow at all, that's that's okay. And you do see that in like private equity cases, right, where they're trying to drive down costs as much as possible. That's okay, you know, regardless of what we think about that, you know, at least it's a reasonable and intelligent application for, you know, it's a match of tactics and strategies, put it that way. The um, with with you know those case with the with other cases, I mean let's just take software engineering as an example. Like uh, my boss's boss is the person who runs um, all of our productivity applications, and I never hear him in a meeting say like, "Oh, can you everyone can everyone just like create the same amount of software in the same amount of time, <laughs> the same amount of quality?" No, you know he always wants more, better, and faster, and that indicates that there's a, a huge amount of unmet demand for software engineering. So if you increase the productivity of a software engineer. By 10x or 100x, you might find that there's still a lot of work to do, <laughs> um, and a lot of high-value work to do as well. That ignores some of the labor market dynamics um, in terms of like who can be a software engineer and who can't. But you know, it's, some, uh, it's a simplistic case. I think that that's helpful. And so I would challenge you know institutions that are thinking of laying people off. Say, is that really the best thing for your business? Because the, the businesses that grow the most, <laughs> generally speaking, are the businesses um, uh, that win. The businesses that produce more. So that's a very simple version of, of you know, that question. With respect to like the content creation stuff more generally, I do think that in theory, con like 
providing easy access to LLMs to support content creation can be one part of the solution to fixing these content ecosystems issues, but it can't be the only part. Like you still, if as long as there's a human putting in effort, you still need to make sure that that human's taken care of. Um, and you know, we might be producing a hundred times more content, but still at, with the same level of effort or the same amount of content with a hundred times less effort, um, but you still need those people. Um, so that, that can be part of it. Um, and it can't, certainly can't be all of it. It also doesn't, any, doesn't do anything with regards to what I would say is a legitimacy crisis um, that we need to address, so. We have one more, uh, we have time for one more question. Giovanni, please go ahead. Sure, thanks a lot. This was a very interesting talk. I think uh, you briefly touched upon this idea of governance and you mentioned these uh, the English enclosures, these doom loop. And when it comes to that, it of course comes to think about this tragedy of the commons idea that, however, at the same time in practice, uh, for example, the work of Eleanor Ostrom shows that it doesn't happen often, right? Uh, um, communities are able to uh, govern their um, um, ecosystems and so on. So what do you think, do you think, it, is there a limit to these analogies with ecological systems when it comes to the role of LLMs? There's people talking about LLMs are polluting, right? Um, and do we, do should we, do we need tools to find better or new design, new governance um, governance models for this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you give me an easy one, <laughs> Mr. <Giovanni. laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, you know, like I am, I, I think this is just so that you know, if you're working on, if you have the uh, blessing to be able to do research that you know, is open to these types of things, working on those types of challenges just seems like so, so important to me. You know, I, I'm, uh, in part through uh, uh, empirical um, or uh, experience talking through these issues and what what narratives help communicate things the fastest, and in part because you know again a, a three year old or one year old things are crazy you know my job right now <laughs> mixed and matched um, lots of different frames in the talk you know I'd say semi consciously <laughs> um, and I think you, that highlights all the potential. Uh, uh, connections to other research worlds that we can we can produce. You know, I said like you know we have a there's an economic frame, there's an ecological frame, um, there's a historical frame. Uh, there's also what sort of the, what it says like a political leg legitimacy or or a political science frame, which I think is very important. And that's where I get like even if you know empirically, if we, I worry about the mismatch. I worry very deeply about the mismatch in value creation and perceived value. Uh, the perceived received value that can create like an unending set of problematic papers like the one about American Judaism that I mentioned um, where it's just like this is not does not seem like a good system we have in place we're going to need a more legitimate one um, so with respect to some of the empirical findings that yeah that's one thing to think about with respect to some of the empirical findings on that thank you very much Brent and thanks everyone who engaged in the conversation. I think it's a super important one to have. And I bet that each of us will come back to this topic many, many times in uh, in our daily lives. So thanks again. Uh, we'll have a short break, three or four minutes now. Um, and then we'll have live music. So see you back oh. at quarter two.